How's it going everyone? In this video we'll be taking a look at gradient boosting. Gradient boosting is one of the two most commonly used boosting methods, the other one being add a boost. Gradient boost is very similar to add a boost. However, in gradient boosting, the trees are typically larger, ranging from 8 to 32 leaves. Suppose we were trying to predict the price of a house given their location, their age, and the square footage. The first step in the gradient boosting algorithm would be to calculate the average. This is important. It's worth noting that this is specific to regression problems. So we have the following prices here. We add them all up, divide it by the total number of the samples, and then we get 688. And with that number, we create a single leaf. And then in the next step, we calculate the residuals for each sample. The equation for the residual is the actual value minus the predicted value. And the first time we iterate, our predicted value is just going to be the average. Taking a look at the first sample here, we would take 480 and then we would subtract the predicted value which was 688 and then we would get a residual of negative 208 and we would repeat that for all the samples until we fill this column. The next step is to construct a decision tree to predict the residuals. So normally a decision tree would try and predict your target var variable but in gradient boost, it tries to predict the residuals. And say we, we constructed a tree right here where our top node was the square footage and it branched uh, at a certain threshold. And then we also had the age of the house and then the location. Oftentimes you'll end up with more residuals than leaves and in that case you want to take the average for example in this bottom left leaf right here we have two values negative 388 and negative 288 so the average between those two would be negative 338 and we do the same thing with the other leaf that way we end up with a tree like this and then what we want to do is we want to calculate the, or we want to predict the values for a given sample. And so our decision tree would be given a sample and then it would make certain decisions on that sample and would end up with one of these leaves. And we use the value of one of these leaves in the following equation which is the average price plus the learning rate multiplied by the residual that was in that leaf. The reason why we multiply it by learning rate is that it was showed that in, you could, by taking small incremental steps towards the solution, you would end up with a comparable bias but a better variance. A variance, a better variance will lead to better results on the test set, which in the realm of machine learning, because our goal is to make predictions on unforeseen data, variance is, is super important. And so what we can do is to help prevent overfitting is we could multiply our residual by a learning rate and that will force us to use more trees in order to 
arrive at the solution. Going back to our example here, we'll get 688 plus 0 0.1 multiplied by the residual, and we get a predicted value of 654.2. Then what we do is we recompute the or we compute a new set of residuals taking the excuse me actual value and then subtracting it by the predicted value and so the actual value for this sample is 350 we subtract 654.2 and we end up with negative 304.2 so with our single leaf with the average, we ended up with this column of residuals. And then using our decision tree, we ended up with this column of residuals. And you'll notice how these residuals end up uh, approaching zero, right? Because once the actual price is equal to the predicted price, well, then our residual will be equal to zero. So as long as these or take smaller incremental steps towards zero, our model is improving. In step six, essentially we repeat steps three through five until the number of iterations matches the number specified by the hyperparameter, which is the number of estimators. And so Right, we would use this new set of residuals that we computed in the last step to form a new decision tree, and then we would use that decision tree to compute new residuals. And then once we have a number of decision trees corresponding to the number of estimators, our model is completely trained, and we can use it to make predictions on uh, data in the test set or just new new data in general and the way it works is again we have our average price which is the single leaf and then we add the residual predicted by the first decision tree multiplied by the learning rate and then we add the residual predicted by the second decision tree multiplied by the learning rate, and so on with all our trees. And so that's how the algorithm works. Let's take a look at how we would implement this in Python. And again, we're going to be using the sklearn library for this. So we're going to want to start off by importing the gradient boosting regressor class, and then a whole bunch of other libraries. Go ahead and run that. In this example, we'll be using the Boston house data set. And so this data set is also trying to predict the price of a house, although the features are a bit different. And then what we're going to do is we're going to split our data set into the training and test set so that we can evaluate it. Here we're going to be using a max depth of two, which means that we're using two nodes, which leads to four leaves. The number of estimators is going to be three. So in our ensemble, we're going to have three decision trees. And then the learning rate is going to be one. And so this won't really, it, it, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be equal to the residual in essence. And what we can actually do is we can use the property rate here, staged predict, in order to figure out the optimal number of decision trees. So we can run that. Oh, I forgot to run probably all of this. Okay, and then what we can do is we can use that number of estimators in order to create our model. 
and does it show right here? So I guess the optimal amount was two. So we're using two. And then what we can do is we can use it to predict data in our test set. And as a evaluation metric, we're using the mean absolute error here. So you can imagine a, a bunch of dots and then you have your line. Well, the absolute error would be the difference from our predicted value and the actual value. And we take the absolute because sometimes it could end up below the line. And we just take the average of that. So on average, we were about four units away from the actual value. And I'm not too sure how much that corresponds to dollar amounts, but there you have it. So thank you for watching. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments.